Hey guys, welcome to another World Audiobooks, another special bonus episode. Once again, we're continuing on with Matt Brown's awesome story. If you haven't heard the previous bonus episodes, go back. It was published uh, yesterday and the day before. Today, giving you a special treat with a, a bit of a longer episode, so I hope you are enjoying this story. I love the story. I love the setting. The characters are awesome. Uh, yeah, you gotta go check out Matt Brown. His blog is a writersthoughts.com, and uh, the link is down below in the description and on my blog. Uh, definitely go and check out he, he's got all like tons of chapters of this book on his blog there for free so you can go check him out and uh, definitely worth it if you enjoyed these bonus episodes and would like me to maybe do some more of Matt Brown's stuff uh, maybe just let me know uh, all the social medias are down below if that's something that you want to happen I think it'd be awesome and uh, but I just want to make sure that it's something that you guys actually want before I do it so uh, yeah definitely let me know if that is something that you would be interested in hearing more of go ahead and let me know all the contact information is down below and be sure to let Matt know that you heard about him on another world audiobooks I think the the connections that we can make together are just gonna be priceless Making that happen is going to take some extra work, so if you want to know how that you can support the podcast, go ahead and just uh, stay tuned after the end of the ch- uh, final chapter, and i uh, got some, some recommendations for you there if you want to help out. So now, without further ado, I give you the next three chapters of Valkyrie. Chapter 5 Errold was getting twitchy. He always hated having to wait. He kept reaching for the dagger sheath on his belt. Bodvar took another look at the village. Occasionally, they were given a curious glance— but no one seemed to care enough to approach. If traders come this far north, no doubt they are used to it. How long should we wait for them? Errol asked. Bonvar frowned. Until we are certain. I doubt she used her real name, he commented. Bonvar cast a glance at Yalva. She was calm and stoic as always, her pale blue eyes focused on the village. Occasionally she appeared content to stroke her horse's mane. It was rare for her to get too emotional. She was a lot like the cold, quiet, emotionless, and detached. It was common for Blooded to be that way. It was still eerie. Yorva was hard to read, which wasn't much comfort. Bodva eyed her for a moment longer, his thoughts turning to how she was dressed. It was hard not to wonder if the cold even bothered her. She wore a simple leather hauberk, but the sleeves had been torn out. Her leather trousers were lightly furred, as were her boots. The heaviest thing she wore was the bearskin cloak draped around her shoulders and down her back. Like her father, Yolva had tribal tattoos painted all over her face and arms. Bardvar knew they meant something, but he didn't know what. Yolva never spoke of it. The longer he gazed at her, the more his instincts said something was off. Even if having a former ranger in the blaze was advantageous, the feeling wouldn't stop. Why did you leave them? He whispered. Arald looked up. Leave who? He asked, a bit confused. Bardvar rolled his eyes. Shut up, Arald. Errol simply frowned and turned his attention back toward the village. "'Because my father is a fool,' she suddenly spoke up. She didn't even bother looking at him. "'So you abandoned him to join us?' Her face was stoic and cold. "'I chose the future,' she replied. "'The Sikoran Rangers will be a memory when the Thrawn unite. Our way of life will be gone. Victor's vision of a unified Sokoros will see to that.' The certainty in her voice was chilling. Until a few months ago, she had been spying on the rangers for two years as a blade. Her sudden change in loyalty was troubling and suspicious, even then. As loyal as you've been, why can't I trust you, woman? Bodva, why do you question my loyalty? She suddenly asked. Because my instincts say that no one changes sides so readily. Fewer still betray family so easily. She turned, her pale blue eyes locked onto him. Bodva tensed as Yalva approached. She was a good half foot taller than him. It was clear by the way she walked, the cold meant nothing to her. I took an oath to you, Bonvar. She said, her voice was firm and even. I was Victor's olive branch to you, and I am with you until you die, or I die. Bonvar nodded. From the corner of his eye, he saw Errold already gripping the hilt of his sword. Bonvar held his hand out and motioned Errold to stay his hand. Idiot, she'd rip your heart. Would you not have similar questions if you were in my position? She simply stared, her eyes empty, and turned, walking away. I suppose not. Then we have an understanding. Yorva looked back over her shoulder and nodded. We do. Bodvar. Shut up, Errold, and keep an eye on the village. Errold simply sighed and did as he was told. At least I never have to wonder about you. 
It was one of the comforts to having him around. Harold was blindly loyal and eager to please. He was the first to cut down deserters as well. The blades were his life. So, tell me about this Idra, Yolva said. She's a deserter. Your rules are clear about that. But who is she? Why do you care? Bonvar replied. I hear it in your voice, she replied. Your tone and inflection changed slightly as you spoke of her on the way here. It was different from the whispers I've heard before. To you, she's more than just a deserter. Bonvar was in love with her, Errol chimed in. Bonvar cut him with an icy stare. The smile on Errol's face melted, and he leaned against the gate, turning his attention toward the village. Many of the blades were in love with her. Yorva turned, curiosity briefly flashing in her eyes. What made her different? There are many things about Idra that made her stand out, both on and off the battlefield, he replied. Of them all was her thirst for knowledge. So, she was a scholar, not a warrior? Errol suddenly burst into laughter. Bodvar cringed. It was like listening to a wounded boar. That woman was carnage personified, he said. When she drew a blaze, her eyes were hollow and empty. Bodvar felt his skin bristling when a dark smile crossed Yolva's pale features. Is that so? she replied. Harold. Harold quickly shut his mouth. Bodvar sighed. This is why I send you out for supplies. Don't get any ideas, Yolva. Idra is in some bandit or bumpkin with a sword or axe. He could almost kick himself for saying it. Yorva's eyes shone with curiosity. Her interest was clearly piqued. They are your rules, Bonvar, she said. I am merely following them, per my oath. Her smile widened, and he suddenly felt like he was being sized up by a snow leopard. Perhaps you are still in love with her, she added. How many nights did she warm your bed for you? Bonvar almost couldn't believe what he was doing. Even by his own standards, stepping up to her was brave, if not foolish. You will watch your tone with me. His chest burned, the cold around him seeming to fade. Yorva's expression was blank. Her smile had long faded. That, in and of itself, was more infuriating. I'd bet you'd like me to try, wouldn't you? Then the Blades would have a new leader. That was one of his rules. Anyone could challenge him for leadership in an open fight. She stepped away. As you wish, Bonvar. He felt himself instinctively relax, even with the tension in the air. Yorva stepped around a horse and reached inside one of her saddlebags. She pulled a wineskin from it and took a drink. You said she had a thirst for knowledge, she said, corking it. Then the library you sealed at Victor's keep is hers? Bodvar nodded. I should have burned those stupid books. I doubt Victor would have let you, she commented. Bodvar bit his tongue. Either way, it's not like anyone could read them, he replied. Idra was fascinated by the Aethar, and taught herself how to read their writings. The lengths and trades she made, just for a single book or tome, were absurd. Do you think she learned how to fight from them? Yolva asked. How these Aethar fought? It was too late now. Bonvar could see it in Yolva's eyes and nodded. Probably. Yolva will definitely try to kill her now. Yolva, if we find her, you will do as I say. Deserters get no pity or remorse, but punishment will happen when I call for it. As you wish, Bonvar. Books lay scattered about the library, and scrolls were strewn about among the tables. Victor looked up from one of the books, eyeing each of the scholars he had hired from Shire's great library. They all looked perplexed, as they worked feverishly to translate the ancient texts. The library's initial response was skeptical at first, but once his claims were proven, they didn't hesitate to dispatch a dozen of their best. The idea of studying ancient tomes that had once belonged to the Aethar was too tempting. Victor could still remember the looks of wonder on the custodians' faces years ago when they saw Adra's collection. He clenched his fist. Without her, the translations were difficult. She had been a good teacher. Keeping the custodians quiet was even more frustrating. In the beginning, they had been more than insistent of sending the library regular reports of their findings. With the initial discovery of the White Fern's other properties, their loyalty was assured, as was their silence. Now the custodians were more eager to serve, thanks to the knowledge within these books. Reports were still sent, but not without consent and review. Victor sighed. To think he wanted to burn all this out of spite, Bodvar. Thankfully, the fool still believed the library was sealed. To keep the illusion, the custodians ate, worked, and slept there. Bathing arrangements had been made, as were their meals and other necessities. 
Victor turned his attention back to the book on the table, and then to the parchment he was translating it to. Some of the characters had a double meaning. It was frustrating to figure out which was being used in what context. Hydra, if ever I find you, I would chain you to this table myself. All my efforts would have gone more smoothly with you here. Great Thrawn! Victor looked up. The custodian's name was Gaius, if you recall correctly. I thought you were fatter. He dismissed the notion. What is it? I believe we may have found an alternative solution to your problem. Gaius replied. He seemed eager, almost pleased with himself. Well, go on. Don't stand there like some infant crying for his mother's teat. Gaius shied away. The expression on his face only made the older man seem more childish. One of the books on forging metals suggests an alloy we can make, he said. It is capable of withstanding the temperatures you desire without having to invest in a cinium. How much would it cost me? The refinement and cost of processing is minuscule by comparison to using a cinium, he replied. Perhaps a thousand silver shards? Victor could only stare at him. Every urge to cut the custodian in half was screaming in his ears. Still, the cost was significantly cheaper than flat out buying the Asinium ore. Only a fool lets money impede his ambitions. Make a list of the materials. It seems there will be no other choice. Of course, we are more than happy to help, Gaius replied. Victor wanted to laugh at how the custodian was almost skipping away gleefully. I really need to distill the next batch better. I can't have my slaves behaving like eager children. Great Thrawn. Victor turned his attention to another custodian. He was much leaner than Gaius. In fact, his robes looked more like loose sheets on him. What is it, Selin? I know the work we are doing is of great importance to you and all of Sokoros, but the library will be expecting to hear from us soon, he said. It has been nearly a year and a half since our last report. Uh, before that, two years prior, Shire might have cause to look your way. Victor narrowed his eyes at the reed, thin old man. He wasn't wrong. I don't need that kind of attention. Even if Absinthe stands between us, Shire could easily get permission to send a small force through and be on my doorstep. You said you have been reviewing forging techniques of the Aethar? Selin nodded. Prepare a report for me on those techniques. I will send it to the library. The old man smiled eagerly. As you wish, Great Thrawn. Selin, are all of you eating enough? Judging by the look on the custodian's face, Victor could see that Selin thought it was odd to ask. We eat whatever is being brought to us, and then continue our work. Side effect, then. Are you hungry, Selin? If I were to be honest, Great Thrawn, we are always hungry. Victor frowned. The last batch was flawed. His stomach turned at the thought of having to throw out a whole barrel. I can't afford to get this wrong. I'll double your ration of food. The work you do is too important to let you starve to death. Selin smiled wide. You are most gracious, Great Thrawn. Victor smiled. Only because all of you are useful to me, Selin. Chapter 6 That's pretty far out of my way, and it will cost more coin than trade. Wolf sighed. How much more? The old trader smiled. Fifty silver shards. Fifty? Are you mad? He smiled wider, his rotten teeth showing. Wolf felt his stomach turn. A man goes out for north has problems, the old trader replied. Problems that might follow me. Look, what if I sold my services as trade? The trader narrowed his eyes. What kind of services? I'm a tracker by trade. I can hunt and provide fresh game, Wolf replied. That's got to be preferable to the rations and stuffs you normally have. The old trader stroked his white beard and then looked at the other wagons. Can you use that bow and sword for more than just game? Wolf nodded. I can. Good. You'll need it. The old trader stepped back, eyeing him up and down. Ten shards, plus services, and some answers. Answers? I have questions, and I don't quite trust you, he replied. You're running from something or someone, and that makes me nervous. Wolf frowned. All right, old man, ask your questions. Did you get put on one of the Thrawn's hunt lists? No, 
We both know the rangers are quick to take those bounties. I wouldn't be in Zvarin if that were the case. The old trader nodded. True, those bastards are quick to take those jobs. Good thing I never was a ranger. He probably would have charged me fifty shards regardless. The old man reached into his coat pocket. Instinctively, Wolf tensed. He pulled out a small white stone and held it out. Take this, he said. Wolf reluctantly held out his hand, and the old man put the stone on his palm. His skin suddenly felt like dozens of needles were softly pricking him and dropped the stone. The old trader laughed and picked it up out of the snow. What was that? he asked, reaching for his dagger. Ease up. It's harmless. You'll see. Have you heard rumors about the North? Are you working for one of the Thrawn, particularly Victor? No. The stone gave off a soft white glow. If I take you, can I have your word never to speak of what you find? Wolf eyed the old man, then the stone. Let it go, Wolf. It's not your concern anymore. Fine, I promise. The stone glowed white again. Good. We have a deal then, Ranger. He smiled. I'm not stupid, the old trader added. That fur cloak and your boots are too well made. Your weapons are well cared for. Only a ranger can afford that kind of care, or has the skill to maintain them. Fair enough, Wolf replied. That stone, what is it? This, the old man replied, waving him off and placing him back in his pocket. Nothing you need concern yourself with. Just be happy you aren't dead. Wolf stared at him, eyes wide. Dead? Oh, did I forget to mention that had you lied to me, it would have uh, killed you? Items like that are forbidden in most places, Wolf replied. The old trader grinned. Are they? He said, scratching the scruff of his white beard. I had no idea. Besides, fair warning, lie to me at any time, and it will kill you. So, my life is in your hands, then? The old trader nodded. I'll release the enchantment when we get to Budir. You'll understand why I'm so cautious once we get there. I could just kill you, Wolf replied. You could, but you won't, the old trader replied. You're not that kind of man. Clever old yak. He wasn't stupid at all. Might I have your name at least? Rock, the old trader replied. You? I'll answer to whatever name you give me. Locke smiled wide. Ran, then. That's who you are on this trip. Wolf sighed. Ran it is. We'll leave in an hour, Ran. Better get whatever supplies you need. Idra sat on the cold stone floor, staring at the crate and the iron chains binding it. There was no key to the lock holding the chains. She had thrown it away long ago. She felt the bile rising in her throat as regret sunk in. Stinking out of the tavern was a simple task. Sigurd and the blade he was speaking with were too busy conversing. On her way, Idre caught sight of Bodvar and Errol by the gate, along with someone she didn't recognize. Two other blades were also searching the village for her, one of which she recognized. His name was Euthan. The man was nothing more than a brute. His only redeeming quality was that he knew how to hunt and track. Rumor was his skills had almost earned him an invitation to the rangers, at least until he had killed someone in a drunken brawl. The other blade must be new. His face wasn't familiar. It was easy to see by the way he moved he wasn't part of Bardvar's usual rabble. Bardvar always did keep the good ones close at hand. What am I going to do? She whispered. The nausea grew, fear tearing her insides apart. It was ironic. Years ago, such fears were trivial. The old me would have nothing but contempt if she were here. Mama? Idra looked up. Frey was standing by the doorway leading into the tunnel. She was holding a straw doll close to her chest. Idra saw the worry reflecting in Frey's eyes amid the light of the sun orbs. Mama, you've been crying again. Idra touched her face, surprised to learn Frey was right. Her daughter then rushed toward her and hugged her before she could utter a word. She held Frey close with tears running down her cheeks. I'm sorry, little sprite. Just some bad memories. Frey pulled away. Will you ever tell me about them? I had something bad happen a long time ago. Something that's hard to forget. Was someone hurt? Frey asked. The question stung. If you only knew. Idra nodded. Yes, little sprite. Someone was. Frey hugged her. Mama, if it was because of something you did, then it will be okay. 
she said. Sigurd says that only bad people never feel sorry for the bad things they do. Whatever happened, I know you're really sorry for it, so people should forgive you. Idra held her close. I love you, Frey. It was the only thing that seemed right to say, and all Idra could do to keep from falling apart. I love you too, Mama, Frey replied, squeezing her tighter. I'm sorry, Mama. Idra gently stroked her daughter's soft blonde hair. For what, little one? Frey pulled away, her lip pursed forward like she always did when she was in trouble. Well, I took a sip of Sigurd's special mead when he wasn't looking a couple days ago. She replied. I know I'm not supposed to be there unless you want me to make a delivery, but it smelled really good and I was curious. Idra laughed. Was that why you were so sick? I thought you had eaten one of Yersi's meat pies while you were making your deliveries. She shook her head. I lied, Mama, she said. I'm really sorry. I'll never drink that nasty stuff again. Idra laughed harder and squeezed Frey tight. Little Sprite, you're so silly. Frey stared at her, confused. I'm not in trouble. Idra smiled. I think you learned your lesson. She wiped her eyes and kissed Frey on the forehead. Did you finish with everything like I asked? Frey nodded, a proud smile on her face. I did. I even bagged it all like I've seen you do hundreds of times. Well, my little girl is growing up so quickly. Frey laughed. Not yet, but soon, she replied. Idris stared into Frey's soft blue eyes and sighed. Little Sprite, we may be taking a trip. Where are we going? I was thinking someplace warm, maybe Absian or Shire. Idra replied. But I like it here. Her daughter pursed her lips forward again. Idra smiled, but half-heartedly. Frey, sometimes things change. We may not like it at first, but it may lead to a new adventure. Frey's pouting face became a deep frown. When are we leaving? She asked. Soon. We will have to pack, though. Not everything will be coming with us. Are we at least going to say goodbye? Idra held her close. If there's time, she replied. Now, go get your pack and start packing some clothes like when we go foraging. Frey nodded and then ran through the doorway into the tunnel. Idra stood and followed her. When she reached the end, Idra saw that Frey had already climbed the ladder and closed the trap door behind her. Idra pushed the shelving hiding the tunnel back in place, just as a knock came from the front door on the floor above. She heard Frey's boots thundering against the floorboards on her way to the door. No, Frey! Frey! It was already too late. Sigurd! Her daughter shouted happily. Idra scrambled up the ladder, opening the trap door and turned to see Sigurd standing in the doorway. He smiled wide as Frey hugged his leg. Idra pulled herself up and closed the trap door, her heart pounding. I'm glad to see you're home, he said. There's a new trader in town, and after a long discussion, I feel we can trust him. The man at the bar stepped into view. Whether by fear or instinct, Idra dropped her hand to her hip, only to clutch at air. She never took her eyes off the man as she did. Ellen, is everything okay? Sigurd asked. Did he see? The question was burning in her mind as to whether the man had noticed. He was hard to read. His dark eyes, though, they brought back memories of Absian and of the Inquisitors that frequented Serendeth streets. I seem to have caught you at a bad time, he said and bowed. His accent was definitely Absonian, though he tried to hide it. It was the pitch in his voice that gave it away. I was sorting out the storage downstairs, Idra replied. Frey glanced at her curiously, but said nothing. It was a small relief. Normally she would have said something. Frey, why don't you pack for our trip while I talk with Sigurd and our guest? Going on a little excursion, I see. Sigurd commented. Excursion? The Absonian asked. Idra nodded. I've been teaching my daughter about survival in the wilds. She's a bit young for that, don't you think? He asked. Sokoros is a harsh place to live. We teach our children at a young age so they can develop the skills to survive. He simply nodded. Now, Sigurd, you know better than to bring people here. His offer was hard to pass up, Sigurd replied nervously. I mean, he's willing to pay in shards. Idra frowned. You can't eat shards, Sigurd, she reminded. This far north trade is more valuable. We could still use the shards, Sigurd insisted. The merchant caravan is due to arrive in a few days. Shards will go a long way with them. Idra turned her attention to the Absonian. Tell your name. 
Eja, he replied. An Absonian with a Sikoran name. That's definitely Bonvar's brand of humor. If we agree, how much are you wanting? Fifty pounds a month, if possible, he replied. He's nobody's fool. She could see in his eyes. He knew who she was. It's not. It takes three years for a single bush to mature properly. Fifty pounds a month would require us to expand what we have. Our stores would be depleted too rapidly. The impulse to slit his throat as Eajar feigned disappointment turned his stomach. The only genuine disappointment was what was written all over Sigurd's face. Well, then I will inform my companions. They were looking forward to having the opportunity to trade such an unusual commodity. Ellen, isn't there some way we can accommodate them? Sigurd asked. Perhaps if someone's crop hadn't died, we could have, but it's too late for that now, she replied. I'm sorry if Sigurd has worked your hopes for nothing, Eajar. It's quite all right, Eajar replied. I'm sure you have plenty of packing to do for your excursion, he added. Thank you for your time. Eajar promptly bowed and then started down the stairs. Idra felt her heart beating faster, then turned to Sigurd, glaring at him. What have I told you? She whispered harshly. Never bring people here. Ellen! Sigurd, there is a reason we do so well here. We can't have strays we don't know coming in and meeting me. Ellen, I'm sorry, he replied. You just offered so much. I was only thinking of the village. She sighed, pulling a chair from the nearby table and burying her face in her hands. Idra looked up at him and shook her head. Sigurd, just leave, please. We will sort this out when I return. He didn't say another word. Instead, he only nodded and stepped out of the door, closing it behind him. Six years. I guess I can count myself lucky we remained hidden this long. Well, Bodvar asked, did you learn anything? Eajar frowned. I really do hate you. I found her. He replied. She reeks of deceit. Yorval glanced on him. Eajar could sense she was eager. Errol was smiling. There's something else, too. Oh? Bodvar asked. She had a little girl with her. The delight on Bodvar's face was sickening. His dark beard and features made him somehow seem fiendish. Is that so? He replied. Errol, run to the camp and fetch the rest of the others. We will have a talk with the village elders. They have a fugitive that needs to be brought to justice. Eajar fought hard not to cringe. Every principle he had ever been taught was screaming that Modvar's idea of justice was nothing short of heresy. If this were Absian, Bodvar, I'd have you crucified. Chapter 7 Everything was ready. Idra couldn't help but let herself be overcome by pride as she checked Frey's pack. Her little girl had done so well for one so young. The trip ahead would be long, and the Sikoran wilds were unforgiving to the ill-prepared. Ideally, they could reach the trade town and burst in a few days. Wolf packs, goblin hunting parties, and territorial orc tribes were just some of the dangers. Hungering ones were another. Many believe that they are the trapped spirits— that only those who died horrifically in the Sikoran snows came back as one. Thankfully, they never came close to the towns and villages, but they were why so many villagers burned their dead. Idris stood and opened the trap door leading to the lower floor. She made her way down the ladder and pulled the shelving blocking the tunnel aside. She stepped through the tunnel and into the greenhouse. Idra gazed at the tea plants. So many years been growing you. She looked toward a simple lockbox resting on the shelving by the wall, walking up to it and opening it. She took out the pouch inside it. We can't eat chance, but that doesn't make them any less useful. She turned toward the crate bound in chains. So sad. That's what her old self would have said. Can you even wield them? Do you even remember how? Shut up, she told herself. That's not me anymore. She could almost hear her old self laughing. Instinct screaming that going into the wilds defenseless was madness. No sane person would be so reckless. As she became lost in thought, Idra blinked, 
not realizing how close she had stepped toward the crate. She touched the lid, then the chains tightly binding it, and finally, the lock. Breaking it would be easy. Easy for her, at least. She felt her stomach turn. No, there's a better way. Mama? Idra turned around. Frey was standing in the doorway, her short bow in her hand. She smiled. Yes, little one? There's a man here to see you, she replied. He has other people with him. Idra could feel her heart in her throat. Little Sprite, I want you to stay here and lock the door. Can you do that for me? She nodded, though Idra saw fear in Frey's soft eyes. She took a breath, shoving her fear aside and stepping close to her daughter, knelt in front of her. Dear one, it will be okay. Your eyes say differently, Frey replied. I remember what you said about people's eyes. They say a lot about them. What did the eyes of the man and his friends say? Freya hugged her tight. That they were bad people? Oh, my clever sprite, Idra replied. You know bad people in the stories always lose, right? She felt her daughter nod her head against her shoulder. Then, since we aren't bad people, we will be okay. Promise? Freya asked, her voice slightly muffled. Yes, little sprite, I promise. She had never lied to Frey before, and even now her old nature was creeping in. Plans and tactics on how to defeat Bodvar were coming to mind. His rules were clear, and she knew them better than anyone. She turned back toward the crate, the irony of her oath resonating in her mind. Frey, hide, and keep your ears and eyes covered. No matter what you do, do not leave the greenhouse. Frey looked up at her. She was shaking. Idra thought her heart might break. The look in her daughter's eyes said everything. Frey was afraid of her. Bonvar, for that, I will make you suffer. Frey ran to the corner of the greenhouse, and grabbing one of the blankets from the stack, covered herself with it. Idra headed back through the tunnel, and grabbed the axe lying by the woodpile in the lower chamber. She then headed back to the greenhouse, and stepped toward the crate. Her hands shook as she lifted the axe. Idra found herself imagining how her old self would be laughing hysterically. Such a fraud, this illusionary life you lived with your little doll. That was what she would have said. She swung the axe, bringing it to bear against the lock. The vibrations resonated through the handle, forcing her to let go of the axe, and she bit her lip to keep from screaming. The lock sat, unbroken. Through the pain, she gripped the axe tighter, carefully placing the edge of the axe head over the arm of the lock. Idra swung again and again, tears streaming down her cheeks from the pain. Eventually, the lock gave, though her hands and arms were numb. Fumbling with the lock and chains, Idra managed to pull them free and open the crate, she looked at her twin blades and the chain armor. Grimir was a skirmish axe, but was closer to a short blade than a dagger. Wallen was a Ulfjur. Idra remembered the day she had first held the sword. Its balance was more than perfect. Both blades had their names carved into them and inlaid with steel. Grabbing them by their scabbards, she strapped them on. As she stepped toward the tunnel, Idra happened to catch Frey peeking from underneath the fur blanket. Her chest tightened. I'm sorry, little one. I hoped you'd never have to see this. She reached the ladder in the lower chamber and climbed up, closing the trap door. Idra looked toward the front door. The thought of seeing Bonvar made the sick feeling in her stomach even worse. I just need to beat you, then all of this can end. When the door opened, Bonvar was surprised that his heart beat a little faster. Idra was still just as beautiful as he remembered. Her hair was still the same platinum color with hints of red highlights. She wasn't fat either, which was a bit disappointing. It would make killing her all the more unpleasant. Overall, she looked well, but in her eyes, the fire he had grown so fond of was gone. She seemed tired. Worse, she seemed weak. What a waste. What has happened to you? Bodvar turned to the village elder. His name was Sansa. Not that it was terribly important. Most of the man's hair was gone, and even with the layers of fur he wore, it wasn't hard to tell the man was thin as a shrub. His beard was full and white as the snow. With Sosa stood some of the villagers he'd managed to round up. There were eight in all. None of them seemed happy to be there. Bodvar sighed. Country rabble. It would be a few hours yet before Errol returned with the others of the blaze traveling with them. Idin, Sosa said, eyeing her weapons. We don't want any trouble, but this man has some serious accusations against you. What kind of accusations, Sosa? "'Desertion from Victor, to start with,' he replied. "'We have worked so hard to keep his eyes off us, Ellen. "'This man says he works for Victor and promises to leave in peace if you go with him.' "'What happens after Sosa?' 
she asked. Do you think he won't tell Victor about what we have built? He promises not to, in exchange for you. Come now, Idra. Let's end this game. Bonvar chimed in. We both know you could care less about these people. You never cared for anything in your life. Bonvar glanced at Iajar, then to Yolva. Iajar was hard to read, his eyes focused on Idra. Yolva was the same, but her hands were on her swords. The villagers wore mixed expressions, but each was afraid. They should be. Victor would be furious about their little enterprise. Do you think you know me, Bonvar? Idra asked. Bonvar laughed. Know you? Come now, Idra. We both know that answer. It was only for a moment, and even then it was more of a flicker. The fire returned. It shone in her eyes clearly. Perhaps the little wave of yours might prove just as useful as her mother to the blades. With training, she can make an excellent addition. Her eyes went cold. Whatever weakness had been there was gone. Bodvar smiled. There she is. That's the killer I know. Sir, we never agreed that you would take the child, Elder Sansa said. We are her family, too. Bodvar turned his head and narrowed his eyes at the man. I think you misunderstand, old man. I said the terms, and you follow them. You are in no position to barter with me. The old man tightened his jaw, then nodded. Good. Now, Idra, will you come quietly, or do we do this the old-fashioned way? She stepped forward and drew her swords. Bonvar smiled. Ijar, go find the whelp. That is, unless you want Yolva to. He turned to Yolva. There was a good chance she would kill the kid if it meant getting a fight out of it. You are not getting past me. My daughter isn't going anywhere. Daughter? Unbelievable. Idra, you can't be serious. You have a child? When Ijar had said there was a little girl, it was hard enough to believe, but to hear Idra say it was beyond hysterical. Enough, Bodvar, Yolva snapped. His nonsense has gone on long enough. Bodvar pulled his skagox from the hook where it hung on his hip. Mind your tone, Yolva. He placed his edge against her throat. Sir, uh, please, there is no need for violence, Sasa chimed in. Bodvar sighed, turned, and threw his skiox. The axe sailed toward the old man, burying itself in his forehead. Sasa! The scream came from behind Hydra, just as the other villagers drew their knives, a couple of them brandishing simple woodcutter's axes. Hydra dropped her weapons and turned to stop the little girl running through the doorway behind her. Sasa! she cried. You killed him! Bodvar felt his stomach turn. It was sickening to watch Idra coddle such a pathetic thing. Enough, he said, pulling his shield around from his back. Let me make this simple. In a few hours, the rest of my warriors will be coming to this town, Idra. Now, you know what will happen if I don't get what I want. You over here is also blooded. Anyone with eyes can see that. These men here, she can kill them fairly quickly. He smiled, eyeing each of the bumpkins. They aren't warriors. It would be like slaughtering chickens. Now, what is your answer? Idra cradled Frey in her arms. Why did you have to disobey? Frey was shaking, tears in her eyes. Idra couldn't think. Her fear for Frey's safety was making it hard to concentrate. Bonvar was ever the monster she remembered. No matter what, he would do whatever it took to get what he wanted. Come on, Idra, he said. What will it be? Their lives were yours, or maybe we should just kill your daughter while you watch. His wide smile was more fiendish than she remembered. You would kill your own daughter? she asked. The way his smile faded, along with the disbelief on his face, was priceless. My what? You heard me. We knew each other well, didn't we, Bodvar? What are the herbs you took to prevent that? he replied. No remedy is perfect, Bodvar. You of all people should know that. You're lying. You'd say anything to protect her. Idris smiled. Look at her eyes, and tell me that they are the same as yours. Silently, she felt hope springing up inside her. She looked at Frey, surprise written on her daughter's face. I'm sorry, little Sprite, but I have to protect you somehow, even if it is another lie. Bodvar, I can't do this. Eajar chimed in. I can't be part of you killing your own. For once, I agree with the Absonian. Yolva added. Killing your own family is unforgivable. The rage on Bodvar's face was gratifying. Idra held Frey tighter. My life for our daughters, Bodvar. That's the deal. These two will bear witness. He tightened his jaw. Agreed, he replied, 
Ben turned to one of the villagers. The man's name was Sievold, if she remembered correctly. You, does this village have a place to keep prisoners? It does, Sievold replied. Good, then we will keep them there, Bodvar replied. And just so I'm clear, if anyone thinks of coming at us for the old man's death, this town will burn. None of you will live to see the next day. Sievold nodded, then turned to Idra. She could see it on his face. He partly blamed her for this. In truth, she was in part responsible for it. Mama? Idra looked down. Yes, little sprite. Is that bad man really my father? She asked. Idra felt like a knife was slashing open her heart. One day, I hope you will understand. She smiled as warmly as she knew how. Yes, dear one. He is. All right, man, I just, I love this story. I would love to narrate some more of this, but I, in order to do that, I'm going to need some help because producing these bonus episodes, as awesome as it is, does take a lot more work on my part. I'm having to narrate them and then go ahead and edit them and produce it and do all that stuff. So if you guys could help out um, in any way, shape, or form, that would be amazing because I really, I want to hire an editor so that I can uh, spend more time narrating, give you guys more of this uh, bonus content. So if you enjoyed this and you want me to do more of it, uh, I need a, I need an editor. So. So if, if somebody, one of the listeners wants to volunteer their time to edit, that would be amazing. If that's not something you can do, then just go to anchor.fm slash another world audiobooks and click on support this podcast. Anything I get there is going to go toward helping me hire an editor so that we can produce more bonus content for you. And if both of those things are things that you can't do or don't want to do, uh, you can just tell more people about the podcast. Because the more people that listen, the bigger the audience gets, the more stuff I'm able to do. So spreading the word is an amazing way to help. And uh, yeah, I hope you guys enjoyed these bonus episodes. I'd love to hear from you. Uh, Let me know what you think of them. And uh, if you know of any indie authors that would like to have their work featured on Another World Audiobooks, make sure to put them in touch with me. I'd love to talk with them. Thanks again so much to Matt Brown. Guys, you guys seriously got to go check him out. Like I said, this is a very special type of... Of book because it's not even published yet so you're getting a sneak peek into what i think is is an up-and-coming author so this is some great stories from a, a great mind love love his work so far and i'm sure you will too so go ahead and remember check him out a writer's thoughts.com he's also on twitter and the links for all that stuff is down in the description below tell him that you heard about him on another world audiobooks and uh yeah thanks so much for listening today guys we'll uh, be back on sunday with the normal scheduled episode and i hope you're enjoying treasure island so far thanks so much for listening we'll talk to you next time Don't worry, you aren't the only one. You aren't the only business that needs help. You aren't the only person that has a hard time finding the right help at the right price. This is where Business Bloodline becomes your bloodline to temporary and permanent staffing. Business Bloodline specializes in hiring internet workers to creatively solve problems for your business. Business Bloodline does all the vetting and only delivers candidates that make sense for your needs and at a cost that you can afford. But 60 seconds isn't enough for me to tell you why hiring through Business Bloodline is safer, cheaper, and less time consuming. We would rather show you. To get more information or a business consultation, visit businessbloodline.com. If the job can be done on a computer, Business Bloodline can find a match. Visit businessbloodline.com and tell them that you heard about it on Another World Audiobooks to get 10% off your first hire. Remember to mention that you heard about it on Another World Audiobooks to get that 10% off. Businessbloodline.com